In this episode, you will learn the secrets of interpreting ancient Hebrew insights. God has always begun with the simple and built to the complex. Join us as we lay hold of the fundamental principles that must be in place to see the panorama of God's purpose. Isaiah 28 tells us that learning scripture line upon line will lead to the fiery baptism of the Holy Ghost. So grab a Bible, open your heart, and walk with us as we journey into the depths of God's Word. You're watching the Biblos Network. All right, welcome back. We, are, we have dealt with the, the Old Testament. We've dealt with Moses, the tabernacle. We have talked about the, the fulfillment of the Old Testament by Jesus Christ. He tells them, I did not come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law. And now we're moving towards the New Testament. Most of what we deal with in this Bible study is going to go to the book of Deuteronomy, to the conquest of the promised land with Joshua. And that's where we segue towards the New Testament. Now, there's a lot that happens after that. A ton of stuff happens after that and it's rich and it's informative. It's life-changing. <clears throat> you're going to go into, from that point, you're going to go into the Judges and into uh, Joshua and Judges, the conquest of the Promised Land, and then the Judges that ruled that era and time. And those are the stories of Samson and Gideon and Samuel bringing you to the time of the kings. Israel asks for a king. And... Reluctantly, God gives them a king, King Saul. And that brings you into the stories of David and how David is a man after God's own heart. Moses and David are two of the biggest types of Jesus Christ that there are. And Jesus Christ was of the seed of David, fulfilling the Old Testament dynamic where God said that your seed will sit upon the throne forever. But you get there into the divided kingdom where Rehoboam loses the kingdom and Israel and Judah are split. You get into the Babylonian captivity, the Assyrian captivity, and there the prophets minister to them. That's where you, uh, from David and Solomon, you get the poetic books. Uh, the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs, the Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. From there we go into the prophets after, after the divided kingdom, after uh, David's grandson loses his grip on the kingdom uh, to an extent. The prophets prophesy to the people, some to the northern kingdom, some to the southern kingdom. And those prophets, this beautiful reading, Isaiah is a beautiful book, all of them are, are amazing books major prophets, minor prophets, leading us to the New Testament. So a, a lot of reading, a lot of, of teaching that we can apply. Uh, for instance, the, the scripture continues to prepare us for Jesus Christ. Samson, for instance. <clears throat> Samson is, he's an anointed one. God puts his anointing on him, so Samson is a messiah in the generic sense of the word. He is a Mosheah. And there were many Messiahs in the Old Testament, but there is only one, capital M, Messiah. Ha Mosheah, the Messiah that would come, that would encapsulate and would, would um, he would come and be the fulfillment of all the ones who went before him. And he would bring deliverance to the people. The Jews believe he is still coming. Christians believe that that was Jesus Christ. And, and we see that in the story of Joseph when the brothers rejected him. That's the nation of Israel rejecting Jesus Christ. And after dealing with the Gentiles, after going through heartache, trouble, and trial, they then reconciled with the brother they rejected and they sold out and they embraced the Messiah. And we believe that that is going to happen and is happening right now. Um, but Samson, Samson is a judge in Israel. He reflects Jesus Christ. He foreshadows Jesus Christ, not in his failures, not in his shortcomings, 
All of these are echoes of the one that will come, and as such, they all fall short of it. Moses falls short, Abraham falls short, David falls short. Jesus is the culmination of and the perfection of that. But Samson, in his imperfect way, does foreshadow Jesus Christ. So you see him as he, as the Spirit of the Lord moves upon him. One way that pretty powerfully describes um, Jesus Christ is, is when you see Samson fighting the battle by himself. His aloneness, his aloneness is a pretty stark example of Jesus' aloneness as he fights our battle. What, you know, first of all, Samson uh, sets the Philistine fields on fire. You know the story. He ties the fox's tails together. He's angry. <clears throat> uh, the Philistines have, have guessed his riddle. And so he ties their, their tails together. He burns their harvest fields and they're angry. They want to kill him. So Samson, he departs from them. Samson's brethren come to him and say, look, if, if you don't come with us, they're going to kill us. You're bringing trouble on us and on our family. And so they turn Samson over, just like the nation of Israel would turn Jesus over. They, it's, a, it's a form of rejection. And the, the brethren sell him out. We see that theme in Joseph. We see that theme in Samson. And ultimately, we would see it in Jesus. As the book of John chapter 1 says, he came into his own and his own received him not. So his brethren would forsake him is what that means. So the brothers, they sell out Samson. They turn him over to the Philistines. And Samson by himself defeats the Philistines. He defeats the Philistines. It says he, threw a, he slew a thousand men. Interesting little tidbit there is that word thousand in the ancient world didn't always mean literally a thousand. Oftentimes it meant a great number. And so who knows how many Samson slew with the jawbone of a donkey. <coughs> but his solitary figure fighting that battle is a reflection of one day God through the mouth of Isaiah said, I looked for one who would represent me. I looked for one who would stand for me and there was none. And so my own arm would bring salvation to me. God would fight this battle by himself. And Jesus stood alone. The disciples left him. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, he said. He knew it was coming. Samson stood alone, Jesus stood alone. And if you can see those Philistines racing towards him to defeat the solitary figure of the Messiah, then you should be able to see the hordes of hell coming at Jesus Christ. And there on Calvary, the solitary savior, the Messiah, not only defeats all the, the plagues of, of the current day and administration that he lived in, but all of hell itself. He conquers death, he conquers hell, he conquers hatred, he conquers prejudice. <clears throat> the Bible says that he conquered principalities, spoiled principalities, and he made a show of them openly at Calvary. And you can see this. You can see it in Isaiah chapter 63. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people that were none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. So this solitary figure from Basra comes. And when you read this in Hebrew, there's blood and there's gristle and there's bone. And, and it's a warrior who has been in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the adversaries and by himself in righteousness, mighty to save, the solitary figure defeats the army that came against him. I know the answer to the question. I know who it is that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra. It's Jesus. 
He fought hell for you and for me. He overcame the principalities and the ancient enemies of man. And he did it at Calvary. And if you can see Samson fighting alone, you should be able to see Jesus fighting alone that day. So the, the man that came at Jesus and mocked him as he was being crucified, Jesus didn't just defeat him in his mockery, but he defeated the spirit of mockery that motivated him. As they lied about him and bear false witness against him, Jesus didn't just overcome the physical adversary in the moment, but he overcame the spirit of lying that was in their mouth. He defeated the spiritual adversary behind the lie. Jesus defeated the army that day. And this is found in Samson. If you can see Samson dying in the final showdown in Dagon's temple, and he dies with the heathen, he dies with the Gentiles, numbered with the transgressors, then you should see Jesus surrounded by the wicked, a thief on each side, dying the death of the wicked, surrounded by transgressors. The Lamb of God did the work of God. The Old Testament Savior did it. The New Testament Savior did it. Now here's where it gets pretty exciting because the Bible says that Samson slew more in his death than in his life. And Jesus, as a New Testament Savior, saves more in his death than in his life. He conquered more enemies in dying than in living. So just like Samson conquers great armies, a greater army in his death, so did Jesus. He conquered more in his death than in his life. And so when Peter tells him, you can't be crucified, you can't go to the cross, this can't be true, Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. And the reason is because I might heal a few sick folk while I'm here. I might feed the multitudes. I, I can raise the dead, but limited to a body, limited to the geography of ancient Palestine, limited to the epoch and the era of this day, I would be a local savior. I would be another savior among many saviors which granted did great works, but not the kind of work God was doing. Because if I die, I'll do much more in my death than I did in my life. I'll raise many dead. I will feed many multitudes. I will defeat many adversaries, not just here in ancient Israel and in this time, but in the time to come, in the centuries, the millennia to come on continents you don't even know exist yet. I'm going to redeem all of mankind and even the cosmos itself. He will do much more in his death than in his life. So Samson is a foreshadowing of Jesus. Gideon is a foreshadowing of Jesus. And, and, and time fails me to to go through every detail, but, but when Gideon sounds the trumpet and he breaks the pitcher and he, the candle, the light of the candle shines forth and they cry out, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, it's a, it's a foreshadowing of the resurrection. It's a foreshadowing of the day the trumpet's gonna sound and the dead in Christ are gonna rise and victory will come to God's people and the enemies of God will be destroyed. There'll be a trumpet. That's the same trumpet that sounded in Josh Joshua's day when they surrounded the city of Jericho and they marched around seven times on the seventh day. And they blew the trumpets and they cried out. It's the same thing. It's, it's, it's in, in, in Gideon's day, they blew the trumpet. In Joshua's day, they blew the trumpet. But there'll come a day when God himself will descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead will be raised. The enemies and the adversaries will be conquered. So Joshua, Gideon, Samson, Jephthah, all of them in some way, form or fashion, they reflect the coming Messiah. 
That takes us through Joshua. It takes us through Judges. They conquered a physical land. We are conquering a spiritual land. They conquered the Abrahamic portion that was the sand by the sea. We conquer the heavenly stars of heaven, the heavenly covenant of the New Testament. It is the sand and the stars. It is the old and the new. It is the 12 of the old and the 12 of the new. Put them together and that is the Abrahamic covenant that we live in. And Jesus Christ came to be the mediator of that covenant. It takes us through the prophets. It takes us to the intertestamental period. It takes us through the time of the Maccabees, Judah Maccabee, the Maccabean revolt. It takes us through the forming of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It takes us uh, through the deification of the written letter of the law. And it brings us to the time of Jesus Christ and the birth of Jesus Christ. It takes us to the beginning of the New Testament. There's a lot of reading. There's a lot of knowledge to be gained from that. We don't focus so heavily on that for the purpose of this study. That will be another study for another day. So stay tuned for that. I'm glad that we could talk a little bit about uh, the time from Deuteronomy on. And we'll now talk a little bit about the New Testament and the Acts of the Apostles. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.